comes there that you're going to think look at and then um, transported the East Coast woods into this space and created these boxes. I won't re reveal what happens, but you actually are engaged with the process and that you're going to think, look at, patterns and, and then um, transported. Um, the next day. And finally, I'll mention the environmentalist, evolutionary and biologist, finally, nanotoxicologist, curator, artists, graduate students talk about um, predictions and prophecies in relation to the environment. So you're welcome to come to that. And all the details about everything I talked about is on our website. So you can just go quickly there. And I will now move this here and ask everybody here to give a thunderous applause to Linda Weintraub. I'm so tempted to fill in <laughs> um, what you've already presented, but um, I've had a really exciting career, which I made myself for myself, and that is I've always worked with the Vanguard. And so each of the books that you saw had to do with what I thought was the cutting edge, the most critical, new, challenging, everybody's bewildered, we can't figure out what's going on kind of material. And I'm really dedicated to making the newest of the new accessible to a broad audience, and particularly to students, because they're the ones who need to use what is emerging at one any particular moment in time and develop it even further. So um, really, um, a lot of the issues that um, Victoria raised all have to do with what's next. And so the what's next is kind of what's unifying all the different parts of my visit here to UCLA. So um, this visit started with Victoria very kindly uh, inviting me to take the ArtSci gallery and present some work there. And then we had the thought, well, gee, maybe uh, it should be supplemented with a lecture so I could explain some of the work I've been doing. And then we said, well, yeah, gee, that's great, but I really want to share all this with people. I don't want to just talk about it. So now we have scheduled eight workshops. I think it's eight workshops. And then Victoria came up with a bright idea, hey, let's have a symposium, which I loved, to bring members of other disciplines into the kind of framework of thinking that I'm going to be presenting in these ways. And all of this has to do with the new book that's on the way. Um, and so I was thinking about this and how I would present it to you. And it occurred to me that the exhibition, the workshops, the symposium, this lecture all began at <laughs> in a life-transforming experience that I had. Oh, gosh, now it's about 15 years ago. Um, I can pinpoint the exact instant when all of this began. And uh, it was not one of these huge, dramatic situations where you're, you, know, you nearly drown, or a wild boar attacks you, or some huge crisis. My house didn't burn down. Uh, I was on the telephone with somebody who I had recently made the acquaintance of. And as a matter of fact, this person was in Ojai, not far from right here. Have you been to Ojai? It's just north of here. And uh, I was upstate New York, and I was reporting the fact that I was really excited. Talked about the fact that there was a meadow with trees and bluebirds flitting from branch to branch. And there was a view of mountains, and the mountains faced west, so I would be able to see the sun set over the mountains every day of my life as I developed this raw piece of land. And there was a stream going through the woods. 
And I ended up with a great gush of enthusiasm. And I remember I said, oh, it's so beautiful. And here's the life-changing response. Three words this guy says to me, is that all? And I'm thinking, oh my god, what more should we ask of land? Isn't it OK that it is just beautiful? And I hung up the phone feeling like my little world of art and being on this planet had been shattered. And I really um, went on a quest. I'd have to say it was a quest to find out what else can land be. And um, so I started thinking about it a lot. And it occurred to me, all right, if something is beautiful, it means what I expect of the land is pleasure. And the nature of that pleasure, my relationship with my new land, would be visual, right? And when you have a relationship that is pure with the subject of your admiration. So I started thinking of those ingredients. And those ingredients constitute the talk I want to present to you. And so what I'd like to explore with you, because I don't really have answers, this is still evolving in my own mind, is what are the various ways that artists can relate to landscape, to land, to this, their surroundings. And I do this with a lot of attention because in all my books, I promote a certain kind of premise about why is art so important, and why does it have stature, and why are so many people driven to create art. And that is, art is never confined just to a cultural situation. Art is symbolic of a whole way of being in the world at a particular time. So this is really important. It's not just a personal quest. It's not just related to art. It really has to do with the human relationship to the environment. But the way we're going to explore that is through the examples of some artists. And uh, let's try to get this going, OK? So. Um, just when I started working on this um, lecture, I started seeing reference to this artist who I had not known before. His name is James Bridle. Um, he um, was getting a lot of attention for a particular project that he did. And I thought, this might be a really great way for us to launch our explanation, our exploration, because it is about as distanced as I can imagine an artist being from the subject matter of that artist's work. So what James Bridle did in this particular project is that he found a way of identifying drone strikes that had not been reported in the news. And he found, as precise as he could, the location of those drone strikes. And then he went to Google Maps and took a satellite picture of that specific location. And when he was done with that, he shared these images on, he calls it drone Instagram, but it's an Instagram or Tumblr or Twitter. All right? So let's think about all this. Oh, and in order for the viewer to know that something very dramatic um, had happened on this site, he describes and gives as much information as he can about when the drone strike occurred and what the uh, perpetrator was and where the drone was launched from, and as much information as he can. And um, there we go. Uh, so he's talking, and I highlighted a little bit of the text. He's very articulate and explains what he does very carefully. But let's read this together. Political and practical possibilities of drone strikes are the consequence of, and I highlighted, invisible distancing technologies. 
and the technologically disengaged media and society. I should have highlighted disengaged. <laughs> the technology that was supposed to bring us closer together is used to obscure and obfuscate. We use military technologies like GPS and Connect for work and play. They continue to be used militarily to maim and kill ever further away and ever less visibly. So I started thinking about how remote can we be as artists from the subject matter that we're presenting. And um, this is really, uh, tell me if you agree, about as remote as I know you can be. All right, so think about what he is reporting. He's reporting on a scene of violence. The perpetrator of the violence was actually carried out by a technologically advanced um, mechanism. And it was remotely controlled. Whoever was controlling the drone was far, far away from where the strike occurred. The art is remote. I mean, think about the fact that he, uh, the cyber attack was made via a drone. The artist had nothing to do with that at all. He recorded it via satellite. The artist was not involved in that either. He distributed on social media. He was not connected to the people who he was sharing it with. And we have a totally disembodied form of art here. No tangible art pro product at all. Nothing for a museum to display. But even more interesting to me, because I'm interested in what can the relationship be between me, an owner of a piece of land, and that land itself, is that the artist was so remote from the work of art. So I have a whole list of like six different ways the artist is distanced from the creation that he is producing. Um, first, he never visited the site that is the subject of his work of art. Secondly, uh, the imagery was generated not by him, but in an automatic way. Um, the end result of what he's doing, he himself is disembodied. He can be anywhere. His physical organism has no connection with the um, work of art. So we don't know where he is located in space. We don't know um, whether he is capable of crafting materials, because there is no material interaction whatsoever. We don't know that he, he's not even the observer of the event itself. He doesn't compose the images. And he certainly doesn't convey any personal emotions. So the piece, what is going on? <laughs> All my slides have vanished. Oh, God, I just, I want that. Oh. No, goodness, this is so weird. Uh, so, OK, I need this. I want you to see what the work of art looks like, and maybe we can't do that. I hope it doesn't keep happening. And I didn't see this come up either. Sorry. So there's only one. Um, there's the missing slide right there. Uh, yes, I have my flash drive. Excuse us, I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, but I think the next one wasn't showing either. Okay. Um, so, of course, the event that he's describing is not remote at all for the people who are victims of the attack. And so there is this huge disconnect between the work of art, the artist, and the actual historical occurrence. Um, Yeah, we tried it all. I can't remember where I put it. it must be here somewhere. Is it? 
we go. Talk about technology. We came early. We put in my thumb drive. We tried. We tried absolutely every slide, and it was perfect. There are three very smart people trying to <laughs> solve this little problem. I need the slide. I can't go on without my slide. Where was it located? You said uh, it was And it was. This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. We'll do it right off. Yeah, we are there. So I don't know, how do you feel about the disengagement of the artist from the actual art product and from the uh, emotional component of what he is recording? And um, do you think this is symptomatic of a cultural condition? Exactly, and maybe that's the point that the artist is making. I mean, the artist can rebel against a situation or express it with such poignancy and such um, focus that people may then become aware of a critique rather than a confirmation of uh, what he's showing. Yeah, so there's, yeah. So what you see where violence occurred are these little uh, suburban uh, neighborhoods in a, or a, a, a quiet little neighborhood in a city or a village. And uh, it's only in your mind that you can imagine that a drone has devastated and destroyed and killed people and wreaked havoc with these, um, these territories. These are photographs of the Instagram um, transmission. How does he present the artwork? As only that way. There is no physical form so whatsoever. You can, see it only on the phone. you can only see it on your phone. And can we still access this? I don't know, because I've always seen it reported. I, that would be interesting to know. Um, he continues to do this. So he started the project in 2015, and uh, he's continuing to do it. There are. A lot of yeah, a lot of drone strikes going on. I think you can have a, you know a lifetime occupation with this. So I just wanted to show you this because um, it is such the opposite um, in terms of an artist relating to a warlike condition. Um, so from a very very distant point of view, you don't see the details and you don't have an emotional connection to it. You're scanning and seeing an overall uh, visual. From a close point of view, as you see there, there's a mother grieving over the loss of a child. And it is um, what happens when the artist is connected to the subject matter. So this, of course, is Picasso, and it is the famous work, Guernica. And he takes it into a very human level, whereas James Bridle was just the opposite. There was no human interaction on the part of the artist or in the part of the um, the uh, subject matter. Could you say that in the 40s when this painting was done, this was so abstracted that maybe people felt just the same way, but it's not Well, 
how does an artist convey outrage or mm, sorrow or indignation? The artist says that by distorting, you can't convey that very well without distorting. That's where the emotional resonance uh, intro is introduced into the work of art. And so um, I wonder if it was possible to re not respond to this and to the horror of the uh, Franco's um, attacks on the innocent people. I don't know. OK, I want to talk about this, because it happened exactly 100 years earlier. And we're talking subject matter. And um, so I'd like to show you what a Malevich piece looked like um, in uh, about 1915, just really a century before. Um, he's introducing a work, a kind of art that has never been seen in the world before. Uh, and basically what is so radical about it is the fact that it bears no relationship to observed reality. So the visual experiences we have by existing on this planet are eliminated. We don't see pure geometries. Um, uh, we don't see infinite space. Uh, there is no sense of near and far, which we can't avoid when we're um, seeing with our feet planted on the ground. Uh, there is no horizon. This is a radical transformation, and this too was precipitated by a technological change. Everybody know, or anybody want to guess, what is the technology that made art change so radically here and here? You guess? Hmm? Not computers. No. Nope. Try again. Yeah. So how about <laughs> for the first time ever in all the human race, it became possible for people to be airborne. This was the very early, early experience of flight. And it produced a sense of euphoria, because that zone of being above and having a bird's eye point of view and looking down upon the Earth was always the province of a deity, of spirits. But humans, the very definition of humans, meant that we were planted on the ground and we could never defy gravity and elevate ourselves into this position. And so here, Malevich is presenting us with a whole new way of having a perspective on material, on the land, on the landscape, which is based on humanity's first experience of air flight uh, in ever, ever. So this movement was called suprematism. And it's a perfect name because humans felt that they had ascended into another sphere, that this was the supreme experience of being weightless and entering into an infinite zone. Just think of the fact that there is no sense of weight, there is no texture, there is no near far, there is no horizon. So the entire perceptual experience of art completely changes at this time. Um, I, Malevich talks about, he says, I'm going to show you the work of art um, that he is really referring to in a second. I have ripped through the blue lampshade of color. I have come out into white. Follow me, comrade. Aviators sail into the depths. So what's he talking about? How's this? So what's so curious about this is it seemed like human having a relationship with the land means that this human has become disembodied. We have no longer to contend with the limitations that have always accrued to us as physical organisms. And how does he present this? Just a slightly off-white square on a white ground, tilted to make it seem like it's dynamic and moving. You get the sense of floating that humans had never even had, could never experience before. And that white ground is like the first time people had actually had a physical experience of what we might call infinity, because there is no horizon and there is no spatial perception. So 
So this is what an airplane looked like. Malevich was uh, Russian. This is what a Russian Air Force was like. And something that I think is so curious is that um, his spiritual awakening coincided with the first time that air power was used in war. And so he has completely disengaged himself from the horror of the devastation that bombs flying down from the air was cap were capable of um, wreaking, and talks about the emergence of the human into the great infinite void um, that was always the province of spirituality. OK, here's another example of human relationship with the environment around. Uh, Claude Monet um, was so involved in a visual interaction between himself and the world around it that all he saw was light. And so the physicality of the material world dissolved into dabs of brightness and dabs of color to capture the fleeting impressions of light um, as they were presented to his eye. So we have an artist who's responding to the world exclusively through the visual sense and um, discarding any reference to materiality. So in an image like this, the fabric is treated in the same way as the flesh, and the flesh in the same way as the plants, and the plants in the same way as the sky. So it's a strange dematerialization of the artist with the uh, view that he is presenting. He does it through these short brush strokes. And so that two forms of de dematerialization here, although the artist is very in tune with the scene that he is presenting, the artist is an eye without a body. He's only involved in the impressions that the visual sense will discern. The environment itself dissolves into this shimmering field of color. So I think if Monet had been asked, as I was asked, is that all? Is it only beautiful? I think he would have said, yeah. That is just absolutely fine. All I require of my world around me is that it delights my eye, and I can recreate that delight as a painting. Um, and because it's always an eye, he is divorced from the materiality of the world around him. Uh, everything is reduced to a sensation that he receives from the objects around him. So here's a really great example where architecture and water and sky are treated in exactly the same way. So he is not looking at the subject matter. This is a cathedral. His, in the painting, it's divorced of its historic meaning as a feat of human engineering and architectural design. Uh, and it becomes, everything becomes unified by the quality of light, which is an immaterial sensation. Frederick Church is really um, presents another really interesting relationship between the artist and the scene. Um, the sh this is a photograph of a renowned homestead. Um, it's called Olana. It was not only occupied by Frederick Church, it was created by Frederick Church. So that's his very glorious home way up on the mountain. And everything you see was designed and constructed by Frederick Church. So that in some senses, you say, oh, it's so beautiful. Well, it's beautiful as it is found, or is it beautiful as it is composed? And Frederick Church was definitely in the latter category. Um, he did not revere nature as it was. He thought nature was sloppy, it was messy, it was wild, and that it was the artist's duty and obligation to create beauty by orchestrating and organizing and producing a harmonious scene where in wild nature it would only be chaotic. So what did he do? He bought 250 acres. He, this is early 1800s with only hand tools available. Um, 
created a five-mile trail. The trail wound around the 250 acres with vistas available as you turn a corner. Uh, he planted loads and loads of trees, and the trees were always there to frame the visual that you would enjoy as you were in a horse and buggy and circumnavigated this beautiful piece of land. Uh, the lake that you see was hand dug in just the perfect place to get the perfect reflection of the different times of day. And um, every component of this property was refabricated, redesigned, engineered, and made um, more perfect by humans than he thought the original creation could ever have on its own. So we get this 250-acre art installation, uh, which had very little resemblance to the piece of land that he bought. So Frederick Church would never say, is that all? He would say, that's irrelevant. It isn't beautiful at all. It's humanity's duty to create beauty on this earth. And we don't find beauty, but this is very much a reflection of the mindset of the period. Um, had you heard about Manifest Destiny? Um, Frederick Church is a perfect example of the attitude of Manifest Destiny, um, which was published in 1845. And it was this declaration that Americans are obligated and destined to improve and settle the entire continent. It was an era when there was this great surge of excitement in the power of steam engines, and railroads were coming in, and tanneries, and it was fine to fell trees and um, denude the hillsides, because this was an example of humanity taking command and taming the wilderness. And the whole idea that Frederick Church embodies in his work is that it's humanity's duty and obligation to make the earth, certainly this continent, prosper for the sake of humans. So um, as you see up here, um, he perches his house way on high to take command of the view that he has created. Um, his studio is in two corners of the house so that he has created like a massive still life for himself. Several cameras or um, audio tracks. It can be difficult to keep entity. track of all your audio sources. So here is a in this example, on layer three, the also the microphone for the camera. Scene as if it was made just we have a separate humans. microphone on layer four that we want to use for commentary. And, and we have imported a background scene. music track on the layer five. So here is a quote. Instead of the right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent, which providence has given us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federated self-government entrusted to us. OK, so I challenge you to think about, is this an old-fashioned concept, or is this as relevant today, and do we still make assumptions about the relationship between the human and the land being one that we domesticate the land, we can take whatever resources we want, that it is our God-given right to do that, and it's actually our moral duty to do it. So um, he represents a very specific attitude um, in terms of the relationship between the viewer and uh, the viewed. So if he was asked, is that all, he would say, well, um, I guess we got to create our beauty. And we create our beauty, and we can take the resources and manage our environment um, because it isn't a given. It's wild, it's messy, and it needs to be made harmonious and um, subjected to human will. OK, so we're talking about how far, how distant, what's the relationship between the artist and the landscape. 
So here's an example of one way of having an immersion in the landscape. So from going from um, the James Bridle's distant, distant remote view to an artist who says that he is introducing the possibility for people to be completely immersed uh, in a scene to eliminate the separation between the person and what is going to each observed. of our layers and sources um, in one place with the audio inspector. And it too is new your master and audio is shown on the far left. A lot of it shows your projects and audio I thought output. Share it with you. In this example, so he was I don't given, want the along with a couple of other artists, I prefer to the use developer our mute kit for primary the microphone and our different source than your video. Uh, and you might want to move that to the live said, input area, which gives you additional control, such as sync delay. Sync delay allows you to delay your audio so that you can sync it perfectly with your separate video source. Global Audio Inspector and in Wirecast so he Pro, took this just one of the great new features he, in Wirecast uh, It 4. is a super high-tech goggles, uh, and evidently it is so super that even gamers are really lining up to use it. Um, so he entered a forest, and he took with him a Faro Focus 3D laser scanner. Um, and he began to scan 13,000 square feet of a rainforest uh, from every point of view, the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf, the edge of the leaf, the stem from back to forward, every different way, and derived out of that millions of points of data. Extremely Hello and welcome to this episode of Studio Tech. Breaking and today I'm going to be looking at the problems with before. audio and then he used a scan lab application to read the scan. The scan was accepted, accessible by a pair of Oculus Rift virtual reality glasses, and then a set of OptiTrack cameras tracked the position of the spectator in space. So this baffles me, because I want to know what you think. Is this an immersive opportunity in which the person is really imagining they are there on site? Or is this such a disembodied situation that it appears no relationship to the actual location that is being recorded? So when you look around, of course, this uh, in your visual field, you're um, going to be seeing exactly what? The speed and the direction of your gaze. So here we got the visual again, and it's really distance. But I'm told if you look down, you're going to see the floor of the forest, but you're not going to see your own feet. And you put your hand out, and you're going to see what's in front of you, but you won't see your own hand. And you can walk right through the trees and manage your way through the brambles, and you not only don't have the pleasure, you don't even have the pain, you have no physical sensation whatsoever. So what the artist talks about is the fact that he's eliminating the separation between um, the representation and the perception. But is that the ultimate relationship between the viewer and the thing being observed? And I always ask, what about, in terms of this relationship, a bodily experience? So it's kind of confusing to me. Um, oh, let me read that. So he says, why not test the ability of the image to foster a union, he's talking about a union, between ourselves and the world by creating the most supremely realistic copy of a place, one that can be inhabited and not just viewed. Why not return to the terminus of the steel cable spanning the jungle where the 16 millimeter camera ceased to record and transform every living and inanimate and invisible thing into infinitesimal polygons and fluid motion effects? Why not cross the abyss finally between ideas and things? Is he doing that? So one of the ways I think it becomes a experience that seems so enveloping is that of all the artists I have shown you, it's the first time there is no frame to separate the artwork from the surroundings. And uh, that is a huge difference if you get a 360 degree 
um, re presentation of, of a view. Um, but what happens when your body disappears? And does that alienate you from the scene, or does it bring you closer because the visual component is so excruciatingly accurate? Um, I think it's really interesting that the title of the piece is Phantom, and Phantom is a dematerialized idea. And so he's making no pretense that this is materially uh, accurate. So when you walk into the exhibition area where Phantom is being presented, this is what you see, and that. And uh, these are the goggles that you are able to put on. Um, this is the scanning technology in the forest. And this is the best we could do to show you what you would see if you were wearing the goggles. Um, the images are black and white. Uh, what do you think of that? Isn't that interesting? So, all right. Is that immersive? Is it not immersive? Is it abstract? Is it real? What is the relationship between the artist or the viewer and the scene that the viewer is presenting. I thought I'd show you another form of immersion that is the opposite of just a visual um, kind of interaction. Uh, this is Anna Mandieta, who had, became renowned for doing private performances in natural settings, in which her whole goal was to merge with the setting, to abandon her separateness, and what is so interesting is that she did it as a bodily experience. And this has nothing to do with a visual interaction with the setting that she has become a part of. So this is Anna uh, with a tree. She um, completely dissolves into the setting in which her body is set. Sometimes even works with fire. And what she seems to be doing is, instead of, like Frederick Church, lording over the landscape, controlling each of the contours and the arrangement of the trees and every detail of what he is looking at, Anna Mandieta abandons her humanness altogether. She wants to dissolve into the setting. She wants to be not separate in any way at all. It is completely the opposite of the um, attitude of someone like Frederick Church in Manifest Destiny, uh, where the human is assuming that the planet is there for human use and delight. And Anna says, my art is grounded on the belief of one universal energy which runs through everything, from insect to man, from man to specter, from specter to plant, from plant to galaxy. So we have Claude Monet, unifying everything according to what he sees in his eye, because the little bits of light um, seem to equalize everything in the visual field. And here we have Anamandanta working with an energy that she absorbs through her body so that she can become one with the material world uh, that is not human. So this is one way for the body to merge with the setting. Uh, here's another way. Uh, at pretty much the same time as Anna was doing her immersions, Joseph Boyce was running through a bog. Now, bogs are wetlands, and they are brown, and they are loaded with dead organic matter, and uh, they uh, have had a reputation of being repulsive to people, so much so that I'm told in England, if you want to go to the bathroom, you often say, I'm going to go to the bog, and got the association. So why do you think that Joseph Boys would 
plunge into an area that is not a vacationer's delight, that is not a beautiful scene. Uh, he is developing a very intimate relationship with a part of the uh, planet that has usually um, been considered um, very unpleasant and is avoided. So among other things, because he is a major figure in the art world, uh, Joseph Boys both helped found and was a candidate for the Green Party, uh, Party in Germany and um, did many actions to promote ecological awareness. And in this case, the land for him is not something that you look at. It doesn't matter if it's beautiful or not beautiful. What is very important to him is that a bog merits respect because bogs are the liveliest elements in the European landscape, not just from the point of view of flora, fauna, birds, and animals, but as storing places of life, mystery, and chemical change preservers of ancient history. They are essential to the whole ecosystem for water regulation, humidity, ground, water, and climate in general. So Joseph Boys is introducing a whole different way for the human to interact with the environment, and it has nothing to do with human pleasure at all. Um, just to make that point, I couldn't resist showing you uh, a couple of images by David Hockney, who was working at just the same time, and um, demonstrating that you could take a full body plunge into liquid on this earth and have nothing to do with the natural system. So what's curious is that Joseph Boys was um, really a renowned and profoundly influential figure in avant-garde art circles. David Hockney was equally renowned but he was a really popular commercial artist. And um, I always wonder whether people feel really comfortable and can identify with this kind of view, which is not at all repulsive, but you're, he's, here's a figure swimming in a chemically laden pool, which instead of the bog, which is laden with evidence of life and all that rich um, substances of decaying organic matter, has been sterilized with chlorine, so the purpose is to eliminate life. So this figure is swimming in dead water as opposed to living water. Uh, I have to say that uh, I live upstate, and there are th three lakes quite close to where I live. And when I get visitors in the summer from New York City, I always ask, bring your bathing suit. We'll go swimming. And uh, I'll describe each of the ponds, and they each have their special characteristics. And I tell you, every time without exception, how do they respond? Oh, isn't there a pool nearby? So I ask you, I mean, you may not want to swim in a bog, but how about the choice between a lake and a pool? Which would you prefer? So are we uh, uncomfortable with signs of life? And has that become kind of a foreign territory for us? Here is another. OK, so we had artists who were working as remote as possible. We had an artist, Frederick Church, who was dictating what is look what the world around him looked like, as if he was arranging a still life on a very large scale. Uh, we had an immersive experience in a virtual reality world. Then I showed you a couple of images, Anna Mandietta and Joseph Boyce, of a full body plunge into a ecosystem. Is that as far as we can go? If we were to say, is that all? If you're going to say it's something is beautiful, is it enough to take the plunge to go to the other extreme so that there is no separation uh, in terms of just observing uh, a setting? You think we should stop here? Or should we keep on going? Keep on going. Keep on going? All right. So this is where I was. Where I started out was probably pretty much like Monet. 
um, I said, oh, my land is so beautiful, and I didn't ask any more of it. And so this whole pursuit has been geared toward how close can I get? And if your body is covered with the mud of the earth, is that enough? And my answer was, frankly, I think I found another way that was yet more um, integrated. Um, so um, I'm going to take you on what I call an exotic journey. Um, I would be curious to know how you would identify the most exotic place that you could visit. Anybody want to share? What comes to mind? You're going to take an exotic journey. Where would you go? Where? Amazon. Amazon. Where else? Come on. Anybody? Galapia. What else? What? Antarctica. Antarctica. All right. OK, so I say I'm going to show you the most exotic place. I don't think any of these have anything half as exotic as what I'm going to show you, all right? So I have actually written an article which is called An Exotic Journey into the Commonplace. And it has become an obsession, not just an interest, to connect with the ordinary things that exist on human scales that are available to our human body to derive information from and to interact with and to experience a sensual connection to. Uh, and this is the zone that's become so exotic because we have become so dependent on technologies. And I am writing the next book asserting the fact that connecting through our bodies with the materiality of the world around us is about as foreign to contemporary life experiences as we can get. So I've always been involved in the avant-garde. Let's see if you agree that some of this is avant-garde. OK, so my relationship with my land, and I'm welcoming you to the woods uh, up in the gallery, is something that these artists have not yet done. And that is, it's a functional relationship, not just an aesthetic one at all. And I'm um, frankly, like Joseph Boys, of course you're enthralled by a beautiful scene. But that is such a little sliver of the way that we can, as human organisms, begin to connect with the world around us. So um, the scene I was describing uh, to my friend on the phone is this. This is my meadow, and those are the mountains, and that's where the sun sets every night. Uh, this is what it looks like in the winter time. Sky is always active. I live in the Hudson Valley, which is known for its beautiful lighting and sunsets. OK, how do I interact functionally with my land? I forage. A whole different thing has become apparent to me, which is so different between walking through, say, the woods and foraging in the woods. You walk through the woods, you're scanning, you're delighting in everything. You may feel perfectly content, but when you forage in the woods, your relationship with everything around you really changes. For one thing is you focus rather than scan because you have a goal and you are seeking something out, so you are much more active as a viewer. Um, so your perception is completely different. Uh, not only that, the kind of perception you're having is multi-sensory. It is not just confined to the eye. Um, so that you are also smelling, and you are also listening, and your whole body becomes extremely alert because you are seeking uh, useful objects there. Um, when you find something which is useful, like these weeds that um, became salad, in this particular occasion, um, it is tactile. You are touching it. 
And so you introduce into your relationship with the world around you experiences that you could never have if you confined your relationship to the, this world to visual or virtual experiences. So when you're touching something, you know whether it's brittle or if it's malleable, whether it's rigid or um, soft, whether it's rough, whether it's heavy, whether it's light, whether it's light, um, cool, or warm, it's moist, or dry. You are inundated with sensual interactions with the components of your surroundings that could never occur if you confined yourself to visuality. So then, when you become functionally engaged in this scene, um, another thing that I find is a profoundly altering experience is that you become dependent on the land, just like the blue jays and the salamanders and the snails and every other critter who occupies this land. So you become part of a process of gleaning resources, but these resources are shared among all creatures, not just, they're not just there for humans. And so it changes your entire way of interacting um, with the world around you because you are aware of the fact that you are a consumer, but you're only a consumer uh, in the same manner that a squirrel is a consumer in order to sustain your life. All right, um, you be, stop being yourself as well as stop being a human, and you become part of an interspecies community. There's a stockpile of resources here, and we have to share them, and we want to keep all forms of life alive. So it really changes what you are willing and feel um, um, uh, uh, that it is um, a valid and justifiable to take. All right, the other thing that's so different is you are aware of your impact on the environment. All right, you go buy your lettuce from a store and you don't see that something has been removed from the ground. But you go foraging and there's always an empty place left behind. And that empty place is a reminder that you are affecting the environment. Um, while it is supporting you. So there is a hole there. There's a discarded stem. There is something to remind you of um, that interaction. So um, I forage for salad and for mushrooms. Um, I depend on my woods for heat in the winter. Um, I definitely depend on my woods for my art supplies. I depend on my woods for the water we drink and cleanse ourselves with. I gather branches and twigs to make fencing for one purpose or another. And each of the fences has a particular function, which means I need to know the difference between one kind of wood and another, and which will decay very quickly and which doesn't. You become intimately engaged with and much more knowledgeable of the resources in your area um, when you rely on them to do work for you. Um, this is probably hard to see, but this is another fence. Um, we bring twigs and branches and grapevines and trunks of trees inside the house as well as out um, to dissolve the difference between a human habitation and a habitation that's not for humans. Um, this is a wall that we've done with um, birch bark that I gathered from the woods. So let me go back. Um, there we go. So uh, a lot of what I do is develop a functional relationship with the world around me. So is that the ultimate? You think it's possible to get any closer than that? 
in terms of the relationship between a human artist and the setting. Where can we go from here? Can you think of another way to get yet closer than shared dependency? Because this satisfied me for a while. And then I started thinking, you know, I think there's yet another step where we can enter uh, in a really intimate way. Oh gosh, I know why I had that there. Let me just go back a little bit. Another resource I've got, and I'll pick up, is stone. Oh my gosh, I've got so much stone. So to see everything as a potential building material or, or potentially sustaining in terms of a nourishment or potentially uh, a material that can keep you warm in the winter is really thrilling. So um, we have made lots and lots of stone walls. Um, so this is a stone um, moat around one of the buildings. Um, this is a stone amphitheater. I had so much stone, I don't know what to do with it. We have a performance amphitheater uh, in, on the property. Uh, this is more stone um, around a little pond that we created outside in front of the house. I can talk about the house if you're interested later. Um, this is hard to see, but it's a bird's eye point of view. I brought the stone inside the house, and we have a little fish pond because one of the things that is so enriching about being connected to the land is bringing all forms, as many forms of life as you can into your living area. So we have fish swimming in our entryway. Uh, this is a bookshelf in my office. Um, I do a little taxidermy. And this, uh, you will have an opportunity to taste if you go up to the exhibition. Um, I have maple trees, sugar maple trees. And so every spring at the end of March, um, I, do you know how this is done? You tap the trees uh, just when they're getting ready to um, bring up all those sugars to make the leaves for the spring. If you tap the trees, the sap comes drip, drip, drip out of the tree. Uh, you collect it in the buckets, and then I take the buckets, and I dump them into a bigger bucket, and put those collecting buckets back again. Um, and when you've gotten lots and lots of the sap, you boil it down. And um, the ratio of sap directly from the tree to syrup, sweet, rich, dark maple syrup. Do you know anybody? You know? 40 to one. So if I want one gallon of maple syrup, I need 40 gallons of sap. But I have to tell you, I love the sap as much as I love the maple syrup. And one of the, you want to get connected to your land, all right? Come visit me in March. And you and I will stand together and we'll put our tongues out as the tree drops, drip by drip by drip. You are absorbing the life energy of that tree. It is clear. It is not dark. It is just a little bit sweet. You just get a sense of sweet. Um, but I have to say, when I have my buckets collected and I'm getting ready to do a boil down to evaporate it to syrup, all the animals come around. They love drinking this stuff. So everybody seems to know that it's really vital. It's a vital fluid, and it comes right out of the tree. So this is my functional, this is my ideal functional relationship, OK? Um, the downed maple trees become my fuel. And I use the fuel to boil down the sap from the maple trees, all right? So at the end of this process where it's a multi-day process. You keep the fire going. You're using lots and lots of wood. Little by little, everything uh, congeals into a kind of syrup. I'm left with a pile of ashes. And that's a treasure, too. So in order to say thank you to the maple trees for letting me take some of their sap, I give them back the ashes, which I spread around each of the maple trees. Uh, because it is a wonderful fertilizer, and I make certain that way that they will be healthy for everybody's sake, because I would like to have more maple syrup next year as well, um, and it's good for the trees, and the trees are good for the ecosystem. So it's a complete cycle. Um, so it's like the cremated remains of the ancestors 
are used to feed the living trees. The living trees renew the production of sap and leaves each year. Okay, now, what else could we do to get better than this? So I've thought and thought about it and uh, have been studying this for a long time. And that is, it occurred to me somewhere along the line that foraging was unidirectional. I was taking, I was taking judiciously, I was taking modestly, I always made certain that I didn't deplete anything, but I wasn't giving. And it seemed to me if I was really going to have a close relationship with my land, it was going to have to be bilateral. If I was going to take something, I was always going to give it back. And one way I could give to the land was to try to fulfill the definition of a really vital ecosystem. And the vital ecosystem is lots and lots of diversity, right? You try to increase the biomass. So it's the quantity and the diversity of life forms that enhance the ecosystem. So I have dedicated myself to seeing how many ways I can introduce life and enhance life that already has existed on the piece of land that I am living. So I do a lot in this regard. Um, I am a fervent soil maker. I mean, I think on the last day of my life, the one accomplishment I may really be proud of is the fact that <clears throat> I have made fertile soil because that's the bottom level where all life happens, right? And nothing else is going to happen if you don't have some uh, rich and um, perfect soil. So there is that. I also create habitat. So I don't have pictures of all this, but I will have brush piles, for instance, because there are certain little critters that love that. And then I do the following. Uh, of course, I've got gardens. So this is one garden. This is another. Um, this is a joy of my life. Have you ever heard of cold frames? It's the simplest de device possible. You talk about high tech, this is low tech, and it works beautifully. And it is simply a wooden box um, with transparent or translucent cover that is closed in the winter months, and it keeps the greens vital and edible all through the winter. So in February, I go out and I pluck my fresh greens from the garden upstate New York. And they look like that. And so I've been planting berries. I have an orchard. Um, I increase habitat. I have um, bees. I have very little of a lot of different things. Um, my project this summer, every summer I take on a project, um, we're making solitary bee habitats, um, big ones like this, um, in order to help with pollination and keep the whole property vital. They're essential to the whole ecosystem. Um, if you go to the exhibition, you'll have an opportunity to interact with the honeycomb from the bees. You'll be able to taste my maple syrup. <laughs> Diane, what do you think of it? Yeah, he tasted it yesterday. Um, I've introduced animals, and uh, before this started, I talked for 20 minutes about this <laughs> image. If anyone wants to know later, I'll be happy to tell you all about it. Um, these chickens would not go home at night. They insisted on roosting up in trees. Uh, we've got ducks and geese and turkeys. We have babies very often. Everybody seems to cohab pretty happily. So these are turkeys and the piggy. Um, I love my eggs, fresh eggs, fertile eggs. Do you know about fertile eggs as opposed to the eggs you buy in the store? All those enzymes have already started working, and they are so rich. Besides um, my chickens and ducks, I have chicken eggs, duck eggs, turkey eggs, and geese eggs. Goose eggs. Oh, I should have brought them. Damn it. They're this big. I, I bought some for Victoria. Um, and they're all different colors, and they are a great delight. 
Um, so, what do you think? Is this an old lady standing before you talking about some nostalgic throwback to an irrelevant lifestyle? Or is this an exotic journey into the commonplace? Or is it an irrelevant exotic journey into the commonplace? Come on, how many people think this is really weird? This is really old fashioned? Come on, we're not going to. Come on, own up. I can only imagine that you're all skeptical, right? I see a couple of heads. Most of you are just looking like you won't admit it. Um, OK, anybody dares to say this is old fashioned? I say, you are wrong. You are so wrong, and nobody was more surprised to discover that than me. Because when I undertook this task and it became a compulsion, I was completely bewildered by it. I felt this need to become independent of the industrial marketplace. Every time I find a way to be self-sustaining, I am just thrilled beyond, I mean, deeply, deeply moved. All right? Um, I felt like I had discovered love. You know, it, it's always amusing, or now, from this point of view, that people say, oh, I love nature. And what's the nature they love? Often, it's that a beautiful view that makes you feel good, right? But I've been thinking about, well, what really is love if you're going to love nature? And maybe it has to do with the kind of love you give to a child or a pet or your mate which is you take care of it, and it takes care of you. You give and you receive. And caring for it when it's sick or it's made a mess or whatever is not a chore, because you really want it to be vital. And I think that love can only happen in a reciprocal way, and um, that is manifested in this lifestyle. But is it old-fashioned? I thought so. And then I started discovering that there is an intellectual movement, which is not just fringe, but sweeping across the civilized world, called neo-materialism. And what I have just shown you with what I'm doing is, instead of being philosophical about it, what I've shared with you is what happens when you become a neo materialist, when you begin to really address the stuff of the world and your human interaction with it. Um, there is a vast literature on this. I'm going to skip this slide and keep on going. All right? So for the last couple of years, after I made this discovery that I am not a weird outcast who's doing something that is so idiosyncratic it doesn't matter to the world, but that I am absolutely in tune with an intellectual movement, uh, I started creating a bibliography. And the bibliography was getting really, really big. So I began to go through the bibliography, and I just divided up the books I found according to discipline. So I've just got a list of the disciplines that have produced books on neo-materialism. So we're talking about anthropology and archaeology, architecture, art, cultural theory, ecology, environmentalism, economics. Pretty impressive? That's half of it. It goes on. Look at all that. Feminism, metaphysics, philosophy, political science, psychology, science, sociology, theology. All of these disciplines have scholars who somehow have felt the compulsion that I found to reconfigure their discipline in terms of a direct physical connection between the human organism and the material world. And for many, they are very explicit about the fact that it's not as if they want to eliminate technology, eliminate digital interactions. What they're really campaigning for is to balance it, that we have lost a connection to our bodies. And the feeling of being part of the planet that we call home, and all the benefits that accrue from that, which are not just accrued to humans who find a home on, in the, on the planet, who understand the meaning of community, um, who become sensitized to the 
energies and the rhythms and the systems that surround us, but it is the key to environmental responsibility. Because if we don't connect to the land, we're hardly going to think in terms of caring for it. And so for the new book that I am writing, I've decided that neo-materialism is just so misleading. People are going to think of it as consumerism, because that's usually the association with materialism, or they're going to think of it as Marxism or something. But if I put eco first, eco-materialism, my hope is that people will enter the book with the expectation of understanding there is a new approach to environmentalism that um, is, according to all these authors, uh, holding the key and the hope for actually transforming the world around us and making it a habit, keeping it as a habitable planet, because we seem to be doing a pretty good job of interfering with that prediction right now. So what's next? I propose to you what's next is, are you going to be a part of this or are you going to be left behind? I mean, if you think about it, all the advances in technology that are dazzling are continuing a trajectory that already exists. If you want to really, really be new, try something different. Go to this exotic world of the commonplace and begin to explore there. Um, I welcome your comments about this. Does it make any sense to you? Is this just bewildering? I mean, what you will see if you come to the gallery is probably another question that you might be asking yourself, and that is, how the heck do you make art out of this? And uh, so I have developed over the last few years um, an approach to art making, which I hope is consistent with the principles of eco-materialism. Um, and uh, the symposium is going to explore what's new in terms of ecology as it applies to many of these different disciplines. Um, at the workshop, you're going to have an opportunity to actually engage with the materials I've brought from my woods. Literally, I have transported my woods to you. And so the exhibition is set up with 20 different stations. And in each station, I have suggested a way of you, for you to interact with the material from my woods. And um, it is organized in such a way so that you'll have an opportunity to explore different components of your physical body. So some of them have to do with aroma, and some of them taste, and some of them texture. And to reconnect with what our bodies are capable of. They are amazing in terms of their app as an apparatus. And it is really regrettable that we've just bypassed it with the assumption that if it's technologically engineered, it's better, faster, more. But it may not be better in terms of satisfying to be a human. So comments, questions, shall we talk? Yeah, but I'm happy to, uh, first response, anything, it'll be fine. Just your, uh, is reconnecting with environment? I don't think that's on, is it on? Like when you're re reconnecting with the environment, I think something similar that's been happening, um, I forget what it's called, it's like micro farming or something. It's happening across cities where people are planting in their homes in um, like large cities and they're growing their own crop seed and things like that. So it's exactly right. what you mentioned. So I, I, I debated between, should I give examples from popular culture? And what you're suggesting is exactly on the mark there, or some intellectual justification <laughs> for what is going on. But yes, you can probably all think of the DIY movement is huge. And there's just, I think people may not be motivated because of ecology necessarily. They're simply finding joy in connecting, in crafting in utilizing materials, especially materials that they scavenge or forage. Um, as you probably know, there's a whole lot of interest in working with materials from the waste stream. So thank you. Definitely true. Any other 
Uh, I can talk loud. Oh, oh, God. Uh, just a question, like, practicality-wise, I don't think there's enough available natural resources and sustainability for everyone in the whole planet to live the lifestyle you do. So at what scale is your goal, or do you recommend people participating in this kind of act? That's a real dilemma. I honor your uh, concern. Um, I just think we could do so much more. If you think of every suburban yard could be made productive. Think of what a boon that would be. Um, every windowsill is capable of growing mushrooms and lettuce. It doesn't have to be hydroponic and aquaponic and all this high-tech stuff. Um, I think what's important is the motive to do as much as we can do. I actually know somebody who lives in an urban area who lives exclusively off of what he can grow in his windowsill. Um, and that's extreme. Um, <laughs> but there's also, really, oh, he's skinny. <laughs> um, but there's, there's also uh, innovations about um, how can you make the deserts habitable. And right now, they're big, vacant areas. And so there's all kinds of um, experimentation going on with extreme composting, um, which changes the whole ecosystem. It creates moisture, even, um, where there wouldn't have necessarily been any. But uh, I just see so much some land that could be productive that's not productive. And I think to whatever degree we can work in that direction, the environment is going to be. I mean, frankly, uh, I have a great bias against industrial food production for many, many reasons. And one of the reasons is each time you plant a crop, the earth that you are planted it in becomes less capable of supporting the next crop. And so it begins a cycle of having to add more and more amendments. Where do those amendments come from? Basically, the petroleum industry. And so um, even organic growing on a large scale. is nice. So what I have done that I'm frankly very proud of is that I have now got a kind of balanced system going where all my animals produce waste. But it's not waste because I'm able to use this quantity of manure or new straw or whatever it might be. If I had more animals, then I'd start having a waste problem because I wouldn't find a use for all that is being produced. So it's a matter of balancing um, and making the land more productive, which is what you do with a system like this. I generate a lot. I give away a lot of food um, because it's possible to increase fertility, augment diversity. We humans can make it better. We don't necessarily simply have to interfere and make it worse. I'm just curious if you could talk about um, this idea of the land and, and maybe the land as you bought it and the idea of its productivity and whether or not like the productivity of, of a landscape is determined by its usefulness to humans. Um, particularly given that a lot of these projects seem to be manipulative of the land, maybe so that they're still balanced, but it's manipulating them towards our own personal desires and comforts and so what is your like ethical uh, mm -hmm. meter for that yeah. um, the way I justify taking from the land is giving to the land and so yes I give to the land by developing the capacity for it to contain and support life so I think I think of it a little differently perhaps from the way you do. So absolutely, I have become a manager of the land. And um, perhaps like some of the artists I'm showing, um, it's not the wild land that is necessarily the most productive. And that we humans can be really smart and we can use our smarts to make things more productive rather than interfering with productivity. But are you someone who is dedicated to keeping a pristine landscape that humans don't engage with? Uh, no, I don't think I feel that too, but I am curious about like, how we can measure what people are doing. 
Yeah, I mean, when do you become intrusive? It is, uh-huh. So there are so many dilemmas I have no answer to, but how many billion people's lives were saved by the Green Revolution? And so it's touted as a great example of human ingenuity and success, except that the products that are grown in this way are so deficient in nutrients that they don't nourish you the way plants that were grown in a gentler way are nourished, and you're exhausting the soil. So it's a short-term gain and a long-term problem. So yeah, I mean, short-term, long-term is a theme, I think, that would be very helpful in this regard in particular. But um, you're absolutely right in terms of, yes, I manage the land. Yes, I try to enhance it. Yes, I do engage. And part of what I do as an artist is to try to demonstrate that we can make it Improve, we can improve in terms of what the ecologist or the environmentalist would say. We can clean the waters and make certain that they run fresh. Um, and we can uh, even use plants to remove toxins. So we can do all kinds of things. So one of the themes that I've been working on is the human body. Let's talk about the human body and how the human body affects the environment. Because somehow that's left out of the equation so often. and. Um, we can't not affect the area that we are existing in. So right this minute, each of you is changing the CO2 oxygen proportion in this room. You're adding moisture. You're adding warmth. You're probably crushing innocent little microbes where you're sitting. I mean, you're doing all this stuff anyhow. So we can't not affect it, but we can affect it in a conscious way. Um, and one of the themes I have worked on as an art project and as a writer is what happens when the body is no longer alive. It doesn't stop interacting with the material environment just because the person has stopped breathing. So are we taking care of our bodies so that when we no longer use them, they enhance the ecosystem? or have we neglected our bodies and how our bodies going to pollute the ecosystem at the end of our lives? If you're taking birth control pills and all kinds of other pharmaceuticals and mood altering drugs and whatever else, these residues build up in your body. If you have oh, implants that don't biodegrade, I mean, gosh, think of yourself as a physical organism and what you can do to make certain that you include that in your practice as being responsible to the environment. So there are some artists, actually, at the symposium on Friday, I'm going to talk about a couple of artists who integrate the products that their human bodies produce into very useful resources for environmental reform and improvement. Thank you all. Students here who are going to want to take a picture with you. Oh. All right, you just come up.